Hey, y'all, it's Dr. Know-It-All. A couple of weeks ago, Letta and folks from the University of California at Berkeley published a really interesting paper. I want to go over it. It actually has some significant implications. They didn't cover a very significant use case in my mind, so I will add that context to this. Anyway, the TLDR of this paper, which is called Sleep Time Compute Beyond Inference Scaling at Test Time, is that there are periods of time between when a request is made, an inference request. So the question might be like, hey, what is this error in my code? There's something here, I get a syntax error or some other sort of error. And then there's inference from the large language model. In other words, you put the question in, the large language model has to respond, and it has to do it at a relatively fast given time because you don't want to wait two hours for your response, right? You don't even want to wait five seconds for your response normally. So we as humans are very sensitive to the latency of the response. We want the response quick, but in between our questions, there's quite a bit of time, right? If I ask a question and then the LLM responds to it, and then I think about it for a while, and then I type in my response to that question or just say my response to that question there's there's multiple seconds and seconds in the compute world is like basically infinity so in that gap which they term sleep time which i think is pretty good there's actually quite a bit of time to do other calculations while you're waiting for the human to do things now this is a trick that computers have been using for a long time while i'm doing something in you know this video recording for example the computer could be rendering out another video in the background or it's checking emails or pinging back and forth to my wife Wi-Fi network, it's doing other things in the background while I'm working. This is the same sort of theory here, except with large language models. So it's a very, very clever idea. And before I read the abstract, I want to give a shout out to the authors. This is a well-written paper. I appreciate well-written papers, so thanks, guys. I appreciate that. Anyway, I'll read the entire abstract, and then we'll sort of skip through the paper. Scaling test time compute has emerged as a key ingredient for enabling large language models to solve difficult problems, but it comes with high latency and inference costs. So latency is the amount of time it takes, the amount of tokens it has to generate, and inference cost is literally the dollars and cents of how much it costs to do this inference. We introduce sleep time compute, which which allows models to, quote, think offline about contexts before queries are presented. By anticipating what users might ask and pre-computing useful quantities, we can significantly reduce the compute requirements at test time. To demonstrate the efficacy of our model, we create modified versions of two reasoning tasks. In other words, they modified these databases to split up the context and the query. And the two they created are Stateful GSM Symbolic and Stateful Amy. We find that sleep time compute can reduce the amount of test time compute needed to achieve the same accuracy by approximately 5x on stateful GSM symbolic and stateful Amy, and that by scaling sleep time compute, we can further increase accuracy by up to 13% on stateful GSM symbolic and 18% on stateful Amy. Furthermore, we introduce multi-query GSM symbolic, which extends GSM symbolic by including multiple related queries per context. In other words, you can ask many questions about the same context. By amortizing sleep time compute across related queries, queries about the same context using multi-query GSM symbolic, we can decrease the average cost per query by 2.5x. So that is very significant. We then conduct additional analysis to understand when sleep time compute is most effective, finding the predictability of the user query to be well correlated with the efficiency of sleep time compute. Finally, we conduct a case study of applying sleep time compute to a realistic agent software engineering task. And I left myself a note up here that this is analogous to CPU prefetching. Internal to modern CPUs, they actually kind of guess at what the next process that's going to have to be executed is, and it prefetches data and information about that process. And of course, when it's wrong, it then has to go out and find the other information, and that's a waste of time. But if it's right, like 80% of the time, it will end up saving a lot of compute time ultimately. So it's that predictability. It's like, I'm going to guess what the next question is. In this case, it's a large language model. It's like, what is the next query that the user is likely to ask? I'm going to ask that question while I'm just sitting here idling along. And if I'm correct, I'll already have the answer and it will just be able to spit out the answer instantly instead of having to think about it. So now we get into the problem statement, improved performance from test time compute. In other words, giving the, the LLMs a lot of time and tokens to think about at test time comes at a significant increase in latency. In other words, time to respond and cost because it's generating more tokens. Waiting potentially several minutes for answers and costing up to tens of dollars per query. So that's you know significant. You want to reduce that if you can. 
And then the important part here is these drawbacks are in part due to the fact that the current approach to applying test time compute assumes that problems are stateless. In other words, queries, user queries at test time and context, in other words, background information required for answering them are provided to the model together at test time. There is no context that it can sort of remember and keep track of, but that is not the case for many, many, many circumstances. And if there is a state, if there is something to remember, then only using test time compute will force the computer to have to recompute redundant computations each time incurring additional latency and cost. But as they state, many LLM applications are inherently stateful and work in conjunction with persisted reused context. So retrieval augmented generation is a perfect example of that. You have a, a large database of information. You want to pull that information into the context for the LLM to answer the question. But if it already sort of knows what the question might be, it can sort of prefetch those answers beforehand at sleep time when other things are going on. And so they give two examples. One is document contextualization, in other words, having a large repository of information. And the second one is coding agents, where you might have multiple iterations. You might have, you know, go around and around and say, hey, can you fix this? Can you add this? Can you solve this problem to my code base? Well, that code base remains more or less the same. So that context is stateful. It's like, okay, once I understand the code, I can keep that in my memory instead of having to re-ingest it every time and rethink about it. I could just keep it there and then I could push out the answer based on the stateful context that I have. And so here we have a nice image that sort of splits this up. So you have, you know, a question about a juggler. So the standard test time compute has the context and the question at the same time, and it has to re-ingest the context and the question and think about the answer to both of these related questions. Whereas if you use sleep time, what it can do, it can read this context on its own and generate a bunch of potential answers to these questions so that when the person actually asks how many marked indigo tennis balls are there it just already knows the answer is 10 it doesn't have to think about it and do the math and all of that kind of stuff at test time and then of course where it really shines is if you ask another related question that has the same context how many tennis balls are there it already knows the answer is 200 whereas in standard test time it would have to reread the context back in again then read the question and then think about that so it would be a waste of tokens because it would already know the answer if it had used sleep time compute so what they do here is they use the space if it's a few seconds it could be minutes it could be hours between user queries which would otherwise be idling or sleep time they use that time to figure out answers to likely questions that could be asked by this context. So this transformed or represented context from sleep time can then be provided in the prompt at test time. So it's just given to the LLM at test time already there, enabling the model to respond to user queries at the accuracy of standard test time compute, but with far lower latencies. And then even more important, if users ask multiple queries about the same context in these settings, any inferences made during sleep time can be shared across queries, effectively amortizing the cost of sleep time compute and reducing the total average average cost per query. So that is also important. So you save on latency. And if you ask related questions, you also save on cost. Both of those things are wonderful. So their advantages, sleep time compute produces a Pareto, or in other words, a frontier improvement in the test time compute versus accuracy curve, reducing the test time compute needed to achieve the same accuracy by about 5x on stateful GSM symbolic and stateful Amy. And then in addition, by scaling up sleep time compute, we see further Pareto improvements, shifting the accuracy up by 13% on stateful GSM symbolic, in other words, getting more accurate, and 18% on stateful Amy. Also, by amortizing sleep time compute across multiple queries for the same context, we can reduce the average cost per question by 2.5x, which is also significant. And then finally, as you might expect, we conduct analysis to understand which quer queries benefit the most from sleep time compute, finding that sleep time compute compute is more effective in settings where the query is more easily predictable from the context. In other words, you know, that, that question about tennis balls and the juggler and all of that kind of stuff, it's fairly obvious what the questions that a person might ask are, and so it does particularly well. If you have that as the context and then you ask why is the sky blue, it's not going to be helpful at all, right? It's a very, like, unpredictable question that would come from that context. And in that case, you actually lose efficiency by having this sleep time compute because it's prefetched information that is not useful to the question. So that of course is a negative, but in most cases, if you have a context, you're going to be asking questions about that context. And that means that sleep time compute will improve the latency and the cost.
So here we get into the specifics. The prompt provided to the LLM can oftentimes be decomposed into a pre-existing context. In other words, a code base or documentation or something along those lines and a user query. In other words, a question about the code base. When the LLM is not actively responding to the user, it typically still has access to the existing context C. That's important. During this time, the large language model is typically idling, missing the opportunity to reason about C offline, a process we term sleep time compute. So here they define some quasi-mathematical terms. You have a trace of a reasoning process. In other words, the person asks a question. There is a trace based on the query and the context, and out of that you get an answer. And as they state, ideally we would like to be able to reuse related inferences across each question sub i. In other words, if you have multiple queries instead of just one to save on compute. Moreover, in many cases C is complex. In other words, the context is complex and may require carrying out significant processing and inference in order to provide provide an answer to Q, so it might have to read over a large document or something. And of course, traditionally, what you do is you just feed the context and the query in at once, which means that it causes the user to wait up to several minutes for a response as the large language model has to read the context, read the query, figure out what's going on and come up with an answer. And my suggestion to extend this model here is doing this, especially if you have a document, let's say that you have a, a customer support document that's updated once a day or something. That means that overnight when inference costs might be cheap or you can use a slower process or something like that, you could run the sleep time compute across your database one time overnight and generate a context that you could then reuse all of the next day. That's even better than the sleep time compute they're talking about here because instead of having to sort of generate that more or less in real time, in other words, close to the time that the query is asked, you could generate these answers ahead of time, like overnight, like hours ahead of time, or even days ahead of time if the database doesn't change that much. And that would then allow you to get very low per token costs and then amortize that over many, many potential questions. So in my mind, that makes this even better. And then we get to the methodology using the context C. In other words, the original context, the thing about the juggler and the tennis balls and stuff like that. We can use the large language model to infer likely questions and reason about the context, ultimately producing a new represented context C prime. In other words, a new context with the original context plus potential answers to questions. So you generate this so it's all the context. Now C prime is the context that is fed in at test time instead of the original context. And as they state, after pre-processing the context, we can provide the new context C prime at test time in place of C to produce a final answer to the user's query. Trace sub B Q C prime goes to the answer rather than C. And then of course the upshot of this is they can use a much smaller test time budget. B is much, much less than B. Moreover, C prime can be shared across different queries Q sub I about the same context, effectively amortizing the compute required to arrive at C prime across queries providing a total cost savings. And then they get to the experimental setup. I'm not gonna go over this in a lot of detail. Of course, I will leave a link to this in the description so you can read it at your leisure. But anyway, they talk about their data sets. They talk about amortizing the data sets. And then they talk about taking the original data set that they had and using an LLM to actually split it apart into context in question. This is the original juggler tennis ball question. And you can see that they went from the GSM symbolic that was the context and the query in one statement to stateful GSM symbolic, which has the context and the query split out. And then they use two non-reasoning models, GPT-40 Mini and GPT-40, and several reasoning models, OpenAI's 01, 03 Mini, Anthropic's Claude Sonnet 3.7 Extended Thinking Gs, <laughs> and DeepSeek R1. So they use several reasoning models as well. And that brings us to the first of many figures here. In general, the darker blue dashed or solid line is with sleep time compute, and the, uh, the, the dashed line that's more gray color is without sleep time compute. So you can see that if you're only giving a budget of like a hundred tokens or something to give an answer that you get much, much higher quality out of these models with sleep time compute than you do without sleep time compute. But as you increase the number of tokens per answer, if you allow it to think longer at inference time, eventually the accuracy catches up and even slightly surpasses the sleep time compute. And that is likely because the context effectively is smaller, right? If you generate a bunch of potential answers and add that to the context, you're effectively making the input prompt significantly larger. And if you do that, eventually, if you allow it enough time to think about the original context, which is smaller, it's going to have less chance of being confused by the larger context. So that is the trade-off that you're doing. But if what you care about is accuracy in a very, very fast turnaround environment, then clearly this sleep time compute is very effective at improving the accuracy at low token counts or low latency.
Next up, you see the same results for Amy for reasoning models. So you have O3 Mini, Claude 3.7 Sonnet, DeepSeek R1, and then interestingly enough, O1, which actually does not very much benefit from sleep time compute, but the other ones, as you can tell from the upper lines here, benefit greatly from sleep time compute. So you're only generating a thousand or 2000 tokens at test time, which is pretty small for a reasoning model. So again, if you care about how fast and how few tokens you're going to be using at test time, this gives a gigantic benefit. I mean, this is actually very, very large. It's extremely significant and achieves higher accuracy at like, uh, what would that be? 12,000 tokens versus 22,000 tokens for the non-sleep time compute model. So that is significant. So then interestingly, they look at scaling up compute. So in other words, not just giving sleep time compute the same amount of compute as test time compute, but giving it more, allowing it to think even harder about this. And they find there's actually a shift for performance as this as well. Basically what they do is they create a whole bunch of context. So instead Instead of just giving it one new context, they think about this and provide me one new C prime context that's been shifted. Give me five or 10, give me K new context. And then you can throw all of that into the mix as well. And that provides even more information. So in other words, it might think about it 10 X as long as test time compute was allowed to do. And that produces a 13% accuracy increase for GSM symbolic and an 18% accuracy increase for Amy, which is again, significant. And then of course we get to the amortizing cost of sleep time compute, which is basically if you can ask multiple queries about the same context, you begin to significantly save money because you have to use far fewer tokens for each query, assuming that the context already has the answers built in. And then they turn to when this is the most useful. And as we said at the beginning, it's most useful when the questions are predicted by the context. In other words, this question about the juggler and the tennis balls, it had some pretty obvious questions about how many tennis balls would be indigo, how many of them are tennis balls, how many are the total, I don't know, things like that. You know, questions that would be obvious to ask. If you ask a question about, hey, what does this syntax error in Python mean? That has nothing to do with the context that we've given it, so it's not gonna be very good. In fact, it's going to be a waste of compute time at that point. But as long as the questions are predictable from the context, it benefits greatly. And this figure shows that. So these are unpredictable questions, so it doesn't benefit as much, all the way up to very predictable questions where you can see the difference in accuracy is very, very large. And as they state down here, the gap between sleep time compute and standard test time inference widens as the question becomes more predictable from the context. And then finally, we get to the discussion. They state, you know, where the questions are challenging to predict or unrelated to the context, sleep time compute doesn't work. That's fairly obvious result. One of the interesting questions here they have is how do you identify which contexts may have predictable questions and then optimally shift between inference compute and sleep time compute? Very interesting open question there. I also, of course, throw in my extension to this that could you use sleep time compute like overnight when you have a lot of time to create these new contexts for some sort of documentation or something like that, and then amortize that over potentially thousands or millions of queries that are related to that document. In that case, you could save multiple orders of magnitudes in terms of the number of tokens that are necessary to generate to answer those kinds of questions. They also discuss extending the sleep time compute beyond the context query de decomposition, which is what they do now. For example, multiple rounds of interaction and a much, much greater sleep time, right? In other words, sleep time could be a couple of seconds as the person types something, or it could be hours, like that overnight thing that I was talking about, and figuring out how to optimally use sleep time compute for these different sort of contexts could actually improve the performance of sleep time compute significantly. Then they note that sleep time compute is effectively a transformation. They transform the context into a representation that is amenable to answering test time queries. So in other words, you, you pull out information about the context that could be useful to answering questions. So it's a type of transformation they're doing. And then finally, they talk about synthetic data generation. They talk about how future work could explore using sleep time compute to help amortize some of the cost of generating synthetic data across related queries or using the output of sleep time compute itself as a form of synthetic data. And of course, since we've mined out most of the internet data available to us now, any way of generating quality synthetic data would be very, very useful. So this is a really interesting idea they have.
All right, so that's my review of this sleep time compute paper. I find it quite fascinating. It really presents some fascinating ways of scaling up compute without incurring more latency and more cost at test time. I find that very, very fascinating. I think the paper is great and thought provoking. So thank you again to the authors for creating this. Let me know in the comments what you think about all this while you're down there. If you don't mind liking the video, it really helps because YouTube's algorithm depends on those likes. And if you want to see more of this kind of stuff, consider subscribing and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.